Is this frequency open? Is this frequency open? CQ, 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 WX0, MIK, Whiskey X-Ray 0, Mike India Kilo. CQ, 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 WX0, MIK. Hello and welcome to the next edition of the Mike Wills Podcast. This is the Dog Days of Podcasting edition for August 1st, 2019. I am KE0VYC, Kilo Echo Zero, Victor Yankee Charlie, and my name is Mike Wills. For this season of the Dog Days of Podcasting, we are covering amateur radio. Um, so let's kind of, so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to uh, take you through the uh, technician book, just going through, uh, several of the key f- takeaways and let's have highlights if you want to call it that of the book to get you interested in, um, becoming an amateur radio. Um, I won't lie, one of my secret goals ultimately is we get at least a few of us, a few of the uh, Dog Days of Podcast listeners going through a licensing process and maybe even at some point if you know the stars align, we maybe we can talk on the air to each other over a digital mode. I'll get into all of that down the road throughout this month, but ultimately I'm hoping to, to at least get a couple people thinking about, hey, you know, maybe this is good. So let's start out with the raw basics. What is amateur radio? Um, is it people in walkie-talkies? Eh, it's sort of. Is it people on these big radios with the huge antennas and they're usually just listening to static? Eh, sort of. I really like to, uh, my first exposure to like amateur radio to a degree, and I didn't even fully understand it at the time, was Jodie Foster on Contact. I'm not sure if you remember the movie Contact. I hope you do, uh, being all geeks. Um, so in, in, towards the beginning of the movie, you've seen this uh, little girl, Jodie Foster, whatever, I forgot her character's name. She was on the radio calling CQ, CQ, gave off some weird letters and numbers, and did that over and over. And then eventually, it's only, I believe she talked to someone and then she put a pin on the map. I'm not getting anything. Small moves, Ellie. Small moves. CQ, this is W9GFO here. Come back. Copy W9GFO, K4WLD here. What do I say? Just be yourself. Where are you, K4WLD? Come back. Pensacola, over. Pensacola, where's Pensacola? I'll give you a hint. Orange juice. Copy that, K4WLD. How's the weather down there in Florida? Pensacola, Florida. I have to tell you, Sparks. 1,116 miles. Hmm. Pretty good. That's farthest yet. That was amateur radio. That is um, her working on a high frequency. And we'll get all into all of that down the road. Another pop culture quote reference. Um, I heard, um, uh, I forgot the name of that TV show on Netflix with the kids in the 80s. Apparently there's, they at least one episode t- talked on an amateur radio system. But I'm, I'm not going to cover about that one. Um, Tim Allen as well. He is W5KUB. So Tim Allen, the superstar from, you know, most recently from The Last Man Standing, is actually a licensed amateur. And they do have amateur equipment on the set. And apparently he has actually used it or at least pretended to use it, whatever, on on the show. <clears throat> so there are many different references to amateur radio within movies and TV shows and so on. But what really is it? So let's dive in right in deep to the FCC Part 97 rules. 
Uh, this is uh, the very first section, and it kind of defines what is amateur radio. So to them, in section in part A, uh, recognition and enhancement of the value of the amateur service to the public as a voluntary non-commercial communication service, particularly with respect to providing emergency communications. Uh, B says continuation and extension of the amateur's proven ability to contribute to the advancement of the radio art. Uh, Part C says encouragement and improvement of the amateur service through rules which provide for advancing skills in both communication and the technical phases of the art. D is expansion of the existing reservoir within amateur radio of trained operators, technicians, and electronics experts. So they're looking to expand people who know how to deal with radio, electronics, and so on. Uh, continuation and expansion, or sorry, continuation and extension of the amateur's unique ability to enhance international goodwill. So to a degree, they're looking at us as like an ambassador. They're expecting us to kind of learn these basic skills in order to run radios and create radios in the need of when there needs to be emergency communications, if you kind of go back to that. They're saying this is also kind of an art form to it for the radio. And if you look at some things, there is a certain art to it. Um, more Some people more than others. Um, and then there is a whole bunch of rules surrounding that, and that's obviously what we need to learn in order to become a licensed amateur. Uh, so what, okay, that's FCC's definitions, but what really are they? Um, they're almost like in today's terms, they're considered the makers. Only they were makers from many, many, many years ago. I think it goes back almost 150 years or something like that. I don't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head. And I didn't think to look at that. So um, amateurs have been creating radios from scratch, you know, back, especially back many, many years ago when they didn't have all these companies making these things. Um, they've made, can they continue to make different types of antennas all the time. They create new ways to communicate over the airwaves. Uh, like, for example, they create they have created all these digital modes that actually, through digital means, talk to people. They've also come up with various ways, and most of these are established technologies at this point, but how to create lower bandwidth voice communication so you're not using a big wide band. You can actually uh, talk within a very narrow band of, um, of um, frequencies. Again, all stuff that you'll eat, I'll either cover or will be covered in the book or books. Another way is uh, they, they learn new ways to put up antennas. There are people who literally throw a bunch of pipes up, stack them up so they get up over the house, and then they slap an antenna on there. That's literally what I'm planning on doing here sometime this summer yet. Um, there's, uh, there's people who put up $1,000 uh, towers or even multi-thousand dollar towers that get up really high. And there, you know, when you get to a certain point, height, then all of a sudden you're falling into the FAA rules as well. But again, book covers all that. Um, and then there's some people, and this is where the digital stuff comes in again. They join the internet and the airwaves together to expand their reach. So as with Current technology, you could be talking to someone from China. I'm not sure if they're allowed, but um, you could be talking to someone anywhere in the world. Let's say uh, France. If you want to talk to someone in France, you could do it through your little handheld and talk to someone in France through the Internet. Really, it's kind of cool. Just all the things that people have developed once you start kind of looking at it and seeing it. Um, so I kind of look at them as, I, I don't know how many of you were in the early days of podcasting. I know Chuck and Craig were. Um, that's when you really have to start making and figuring out how to distribute this stuff and get it published out and allow people to consume it. It kind of sort of reminded me of those early days, and I was part of that kind of early days era, era 
most people have to find, but I had to figure out how to make it work and so on. So it's kind of like that for people who can relate to the early days of podcasting, but there's so much more to learn and there's so much more that you can do with it than just putting out a recording out in a file server and linking to an XML file and everyone can get to it. So um, other things amateur radio does is they provide emergency communications. We talked about the FCC side. Um, the thing that comes in with emergency communications, some people look at you like you're, stu- or some people look at you when you say you're amateur radio. They're like, "What's the purpose now? We have these things called phones. Well, these things called phones require these things called cell phone towers that need telephone lines or internet lines to communicate to a server." to then send out to another antenna to the another commu- via another communications ma- manner to go to the next cell phone. That requires a lot of infrastructure. Let's say you have a hurricane blow through. That can rip out half of that your infrastructure just like that. Let's see if I can do that again. There, you maybe hear that one better. So, uh, amateurs, on the other hand, my little handheld, I can talk to anyone who also ha- who's who also tuned the exact same frequency, and we can talk as you know, just like nothing, you know, just like nothing's there. Much like your little handheld walkie talkies would work. The only difference is our little hand; those uh, usually those um, FRS radios, I think they're called. Their range is usually pretty limited because they don't put out a lot of power. Uh, typically, I think it's like half a watt of power, 0.4 or something like that. Uh, those are the, the little cheap ones. Um, and then you have uh, FRMS, I don't remember the exact initials. That's another one that you have to have a diff- separate license for. They have much higher power, but then you have to pay the $70 every 10-year fee in order to use those. And guess what? Amateur radios, $15. And it's good, assuming you renew every 10 years, which, best as I can tell, there's no cost. You're paying 15 bucks, maybe 30 if you want to get higher level ones or whatever. You're paying 15 bucks for life. You can technically, if you want to build a handheld that put out 100 watts, you could create a handheld that put out 100 watts of power and you can do a lot of communications with that. Most handhelds are about five watts that you buy. There's some that's gone up to, I've seen up to about 10, but usually not much more than that. So, you know, if you start looking at emergency where there's no infrastructure, you're, these guys, these people, I shouldn't say guys, these people are on the air almost instantly. And on top of that, because still you're on handheld, you're what, at most six feet off the ground. Uh, they still don't reach very far, but most of these, uh, clubs and these organizations, they have, uh, what they call a repeater and some way of putting it up out as a temporary type thing. I know our local club here, I seen theirs. It's just a, a trailer with a little tower on it. And I don't know how tall it is or anything, but they just flip it up or they put the antenna on there. They flip it up. They hook up a repeater system to it. All of a sudden, they are mobile, and probably within, I assume, about half hour, hour, they, or there's a repeater up. Everyone's talking through the repeater. And now, all of a sudden, your range is now tripled, more maybe. Depends on how high the tower is. And when you're talking about disaster, anytime you can start communications, is the sooner you can start communications, the better off you are. So that's a really good, useful thing. And amateurs are really good at that. At least some of them. Um, some people like to work with satellite communications. Um, so most people are limited for like the tech type, tech license people. We'll cover that in a second. Uh, they're usually limited by how far their little uh, UHF, VHF radios can reach, which Technically, up can be up to just over the horizon, but usually it's not much more than that. Again, cover later. There's a lot of information. 
Um, but now if you could shoot it up into the sky and bounce it off something high up in the sky, let's say 50 plus kilometers above the Earth, a.k.a. a satellite, you got a hell of a lot more range that you can do. So some people like to enjoy doing that. They'll they'll make a um, a special antenna that can hit these satellites, and there's many of them floating up over us. You can make uh, little communications to I don't I don't want to say anywhere in the world, but at least you know a, a much wider span than what you normally can with um, normal VHF UHF radios. And most of those satellites are VHF UHF. Because reasons <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, but there you go. Again, there's different ways people are experimenting with learning how to do things. I think one of the recent rockets just launched that had five new amateur ra- radio satellites in there. I think it was. So, you know, really interesting kind of stuff. Uh, some people really like to do these contests. Um, so a contest is usually how many contacts can you make within a given time frame? Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the field day. Uh, most local areas would have one. That is a, is a competition. And the club is trying to make as many contacts to various states as much as they can. I think the winner had hit like 26 or 28 states. Or no, that wasn't the winner. That was just somebody had worked like 26, 27 states. So that's another thing that happens that some people really enjoy is that contest. Uh, Other ways you can do it is through CW or Morse code. I'll get into again CW later. Uh, Or various digital modes through the airwaves. Some people really like that kind of stuff. Um, And then some will like to send video and pictures. So there's a wide variety of things you can do and really... The bandwidth is the limitation here, or the the limitation is your imagination and based upon the rules that are out there. Heck, there's people who like to use as little power as possible to try and make as far as contacts as possible. There's all these interesting things people like to do, and if you start researching more and more, the more you're like, "Wow, that's really cool." Um, so. What can you do with an amateur radio license? Well, that really depends upon your license class. So let's talk a little bit more about license classes. So I'm going to open up my uh, band, my amateur, newest amateur radio bands here, just so I can talk a little smarter here than what I had written in my notes here. So technicians, uh, ultimately, technicians have access to UHF and VHF frequencies. I will cover a little bit more about the frequency type things later, but um, those are typically your handhelds. Uh, VH, I can't remember. I think uh, FM radio is in VHF, I believe. A lot of your over-the-air TV these days are through UHF. Um, That just kind of gives you a little bit idea of what is out there. Technicians can also work in some areas of the high frequency bands but typically it's within the morse code cw ranges it's just so you can get a little taste into it without having full access once you go up into um the general license or the amateur extra license all of a sudden you get a lot more openings so um that jody foster reference she was on hf so she and who knows what one i don't even remember if they showed the radio per se. But that's when you can make long distance uh, contacts. Um, I think a popular one is like 40 meters, um, like we're on seven megahertz. A lot of contacts are made through that frequency. Europe, um, Asia, um, um, come on brain, Antarctica, you name it. Um, again, kind of cover how that works down the road here a little bit, but uh, VHF, UHF really can't do that because of how um, how those frequencies work over the high frequency bands. And again, more on this later. We're, we're just starting. I'm just trying to give you a little nugget 
of how things are going to start. Um, and really, what can you do with it? I already talked about that. The makers, the commu- emergency communication satellite. Um, and I guess then that kind of leads to, do I have to do this stuff? No, you don't have to uh, do emergency communications. That doesn't interest you. Uh, maybe you are more interested in doing events like um, a marathon or a uh, long distance bike thing or something. You can be kind of a, a communications person there. Some of it might be emergency, emergency. Some of it might be just checking in. Uh, I have not worked anything, so I don't really know what I'm talking about there. But there's also the fun stuff and not necessarily have to work. Um, oh, by the way, I did not add in this in my notes, but amateurs cannot get paid to be doing radio work. That's the one thing, and that's mentioned in the the non-commercial within the license. You cannot make money being while being on the radio, nor can you do business on the radio. This is stressed heavily within every single instruction manual. It's it's volunteer only, and it is um, you can't conduct business. So, how you know most hobbies you can maybe make money on it, at least somewhat. You can make money on the hobby. You just can't make money doing the hobby. I don't know if that makes sense. So, like, like I said, you can't make money while using the radio. You, I. You know, me as a city employee, I can't be working with the police department and because I know amateur radio and actually working with them and working and being paid to to be on the radio. That's a no-no. Now I can say, oh, I'll stay after work and then uh, I'll be on the radio and hang out with you guys. That can be done. I just can't be on the clock. But you have like YouTubers, you have websites, you have Patreon feeds for YouTubers or podcasters. I don't know what all is there. You can still make money on the hobby. It's just not with the hobby. I don't know if that makes sense otherwise. Hopefully that's clear as mud. Um, so how do you get your license? I mean, that's the last major question I think that that's kind of laid out here in this kind of the first chapter I'm kind of going through. Well, as I mentioned, there's three levels, tech, general, and amateur extra. And I don't know if I said this before or not, because my notes don't have it here. If in order for you to get your general license, you have first have to pass your technician license. So these are stacked. You have to take them in order. Uh, so you can get just your tech license and never do anything else and be perfectly happy. And that's fine. Um, I was going to do that, but I, about three weeks before I was going to take the test, like, let's study the general. So I studied the general, I passed the general, and now I'm a general licensed one. So I had to take, so on that day I took my test, I took the tech license test, I passed, I took the general test license, I passed, and just for giggles, I took the extra license test and utterly failed apparently, but... I didn't study. I didn't knew nothing about what was on there, so I wasn't surprised. So the extra can only be taken once you possess a general license. So, but there again, you can go all the way to amateur extra in one day, and you're just fine. You just have to take all three tests. Um, as far as how to learn and how to do this, uh, the big way that I see anyway is most people buy the ARRL. Uh, license book for the class that you want. So ARRL is the American Radio Re- Relay American Radio Relay League. They are one of the big. They are they are the biggest organization within the U.S. for amateur radio. So they produce all these books. They create the sample tests, and it doesn't matter if you go to the ARRL test site or you go to another test site. They're all the same tests. Um, the nice thing about this is, one, you can just take the book, you can study, you can look at sample tests, sample questions, and te- and go take your test. There's many apps, there's many websites that have practice tests. So you can just start doing 
practice test. I did a lot of those. I used an app and then I went to another site and I took practice tests and I practiced, practiced, practiced until I felt like I was ready. Um, and then there's also t- you know, actual class, classroom type classes, whether it's online or in the physical room. And you can just have someone teach you everything. Um, or you can do like I did. I kind of did a mix of the book. I also mixed in a sprinkle of some YouTube videos. Um, I'll link to a couple really good ones that, um, at least one that, the one I used, I don't want to reference the other one if it's junk, but there's many other people who have done these video sessions and some of them enhance the book where they say, okay, I'm not going to cover everything, but here's some of the things that you should note or here's how some of the things work so you can put context to it. In other words, they might actually just be a full blown class. You know, he didn't go that far. Uh, for me, the eight, the book, the practice tests, and the videos allowed me to pass through all of them. Uh, the other thing I will mention, and this is this is kind of a key thing to remember: um, the sample questions. They are the questions on the test. Uh, for the tech in general, you are given a pool of 35 questions. So there's 35 questions on both of those tests. You have to pass, I th- can't remember if it's 26 or 27. So all you have to do is get 26 or tw- 26, 27, whatever it is, right. And you pass the test. So it's like a 75-ish percent accurate. So you got to get a C. You got to get a good solid C and you pass. Ultimate goal is you shoot for, uh, see the best you can above that, but the bare minimum is getting those bare minimum questions answered. But practice tests have all the task questions. You hit that practice test a few dozen times, you've covered just about every question, and if you're getting a solid 85%, you are ready to take the test. <clears throat> um, I was even hitting up to 90% and uh, by that, by a certain point, I was like, okay, I am good. I hit every cut question. I know what I'm doing. I have every answer memorized. And that's really what I did. Ultimately, I'll talk a little bit more about that throughout the week, but, uh, ultimately it's, you don't have a context to apply it to It's really book learning. So right now I, I still say I am book smart. I am not practice smart this is really how this is this works ultimately is you are get book smart you understand you learn this stuff well enough to take the test but honestly you really don't know much it's when you start doing the hobby is when you really learn um as far as the testing process goes your local area will probably have several different testing sites. You may have to travel a little range to Pain Pond, where you're at, and so on. I ultimately drove up to the Twin Cities area. I'm about an hour away from that and took the test up there because there wasn't anything immediate local area. Um, but so the test is going to give you a flashback to your school days. It's a closed book test, so you can't use it as a reference even. You can in real world, obviously. You just can't in the, in the actual test. Um, you most people, most organizations I've seen recommend bringing a pen or pencil or a couple of them just to fill in the circles. Uh, you can take a calculator for help in doing the math. You cannot have any of the formulas programmed into it. So I did take my graphing calculator. Just not, there was nothing in the memory, so and I use that. You can use any calculator. I would recommend like a scientific calculator, especially at the higher levels. Um, but then you do have to memorize the, the mathematical formulas. And honestly, there's only a, like one with the theory of electricity, uh, the Ohm's law or whatever it is. That's one that you have to learn. And then the other is how to calculate the, um, what do you call it? The, the band, the, the, the wavelength. That's when we say 40 meters, 20 meters, 10 meters. That's the wavelength. So there's one formula for that. There's one formula for um, some electricity stuff. And that's really the only two you, at technical level, that you really have to memorize. And even up through the general, those two basic formulas pretty, co- pretty much cover you for most of that stuff. 
Um, you'll have to fill a few forms when you show up. Um, basically, it's, you know, it's your name and the information the FCC needs to sign you your license. And then there's a small fee. Um, most, From what I hear, most people pay the same fee of $15. There may be some that pay, charge you a little more or some charge you a little less, depending upon the organization you go through. But ultimately, it's like 15 bucks. You can take one test. You can take all three tests. It's one fee. So that's really nice. Now, like I said, it's really cheap. Um, and then ultimately, just take the test. If you pass, awesome. You now, once you get your call letters, you got your ticket to go on the air uh, within your allotted frequencies. Um, you get a general, you get more frequencies. You get amateur extra, you even get even more frequencies. <clears throat> All of that's covered in the book a little bit more in depth if you're curious. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of interesting. I have not been on high frequencies myself yet. And holy cow, this is extremely long. I will try and keep all the others a little bit shorter. I just wanted to cover this as one topic and then uh, summarize beyond that because this is uh, this is laying gr- groundwork. Um, this will be the entire series. So uh, do uh, be prepared for some, at least a little bit of a ride. Um, and as I was going to call it earlier, that now hearing about that, I know like... Um, uh, Craig is big into the Boy Scouts. Well, really, ham radio and Boy Scouts are kind of work hand in hand because wasn't the Boy Scout thing uh, always be prepared? Well, I got a radio. I can, as soon as, if my cell phone doesn't work, I can hop on the radio and I can talk to anyone or at least that people in my local area. And I do on a regular basis now, especially with my weather stuff. The other thing I did not mention here, and I think I will because you never know when it's going to pass, you can request a vanity license. So my call letters right now is KE0VYC. C and Z or Z, whoever's not, you know, I'm talking to. If you say C and Z, they kind of intermix. And I I like the call. The call it was okay. But I always had this fantasy of doing like a DWF for dwarf or like D&D dwarf type stuff. But uh, the other day I was looking, it's like someone had a WX uh, for the first two letters. I'm like, wait a minute. And I looked, WX0MIK is not assigned to anybody. So I'm currently going through the the, uh, vanity license process to get uh, WX0MIK or wx mike or wx zero mike or weather zero mike because wx is short for weather kind of cool huh (laughs) i was not expecting that one to be open so at some point during the series i may you may be hearing me call myself now wx zero mik um if the pass clears as far as i can tell it should but you just never know so if it fails, eh, I'll keep my existing call sign as fine until I come up with something that better. Otherwise, I'll have a new call sign. So um, you've heard the you. If you want to know what uh, Morse code sounds like, I have at the beginning and at the end. Um, I'm debating if I want to do anything special with that. If anyone can decode it. Um, so if you know how to decode it, or if you try to decode it. Please don't cheat. There are ways to cheat. Um, and if you are already no CW and you're an amateur license, please don't respond because that's cheating. Um, I I don't know what I'll do yet. Maybe I'll do a five dollar gift card. I don't know. I I haven't gone quite. I haven't thought that part through yet. Um, but. Uh, we'll see what happens here. So if you can decode it, send me an email. My email is mike at mikewills.me. Or if you prefer, until my license changes and it's not going to work, but ke 0 uh, vyc at net. Again, pro- probably easier to send me the, to mike, mike at mikewills. 
Uh, you can also find me on Facebook at um, n- my name on there is Mike Wills. Twitter, Mike Wills. My website is at MikeWills.me. And um, yeah, that should cover most of the stuff. So uh, I really appreciate everyone listening. And I will talk to you tomorrow. So uh, for now, 73 from KE0 VYC. The frequency is clear. WX0MIK 73.